into 2 Corinthians. And uh, if you're new with us this morning, we are journeying through the Bible. Uh, we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Word of God. And it is my goal and my heart and intent to teach you the Word of God and to go verse by verse. And just like Paul says, I want to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And uh, we have been going through, we went through 1 Corinthians, and now we are in 2 Corinthians. And we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to pick up in verse 12 this morning. It says, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more abundant toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now, I trust you will understand even to the end. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not writing, I didn't keep anything from you. I'm not trying to be deceptive and trying to hide things. He says it's all out in the open. Verse 14, he says, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of of the Lord Jesus. He says, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by the way to you to Macedonia and then to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped on the way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly or the things I planned do I plan according to the flesh that with me that there should be yes, yes, and no, no? Verse 18 says, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Verse 19, it says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among us by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Verse 20, follow along with me. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? Verse 3, it says, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow over those whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. And then lastly, in verse 4, it says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we pray for those in, in a similar situation as Paul, Lord, that have been criticized, going through a trial of criticism. Lord God, we pray that this passage would bring comfort to their hearts, Lord. Lord, show us what to do when we are criticized by others. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your word. and We pray, Lord, that it would dwell richly within us and it would produce fruit. In your name we pray, amen. Years ago, there was a famous preacher, and perhaps you've heard me speak of him, by the name of Charles Spurgeon. And Charles and Susanna, his wife Spurgeon, had a hobby in which they raised chickens 
uh, and sold the eggs. And many of the family members would approach Charles and Susanna and try to receive a discount or even free eggs from Charles and Susanna. And over the years, Charles and Susanna never gave their relatives, their family members, a discount on the eggs. And many people labeled him as greedy, uh, stingy, in various ways. On one particular occasion, while Miss Spurgeon, Susanna Spurgeon, was selling her eggs uh, at the local marketplace, so the story goes, one of their children came and approached them and asked for some eggs. And Susanna Spurgeon said that, she, that their child needed to pay full price for the eggs. Well, at that time, there was a particular woman who was nearby and overheard the conversation, and she went and spread a rumor around town saying that the Spurgeon parents were so cheap they even make their children pay for their own food. Years later, after this, both the Spurgeon parents, Charles and Susanna uh, Spurgeon, had passed away, it was there that their financials were open and they looked to, and they discovered that all the proceeds from the eggs that they were selling went to support two elderly Welsh widows. And it was there that they, all the criticism that they had received over the years from the misunderstanding that people had about them was realized what was taking place. See, over the years, the Spurgeons were greatly criticized for not giving discounts on their eggs. And because of the misunderstanding, it led to criticism. In this very personal letter, Paul opened his heart to the Corinthians and to us, and he revealed the trials that he was experiencing. And to begin with, he had been severely criticized by some of the people that were in Corinth. When he changed his mind, they said, well, he does not keep his promise. And when Christians misunderstand each other, the wounds can go very deep. And while many a person would have collapsed under the same crisis of criticism, we find the Apostle Paul not collapsing, but triumphing over the circumstances of criticism. And not because he was a mighty apostle, but because of the God he served was bigger than his circumstances. And this morning, we look at several different ways on how the believer handles personal criticism. Notice the first thing that the Apostle Paul tells us in verse 12 is to have a clear conscience when criticism arises. Notice verse 12. He says, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience. Think about it this way. Perhaps you have been misunderstood in some manner and criticized by that because of that misunderstanding. Oftentimes when we hear the criticism and people were, you know, someone will come to us maybe and they'll say, you know, I don't like the way you did this or I don't like this about you or whatever the case may be. And a lot of times what we do is we kind of, we, ha we have our hands folded. Sometimes we sit on our hands to control our hands and we're, you know, mm -hmm, yeah, okay, yeah, mm -hmm, you know, and just kind of, you know, we're trying to contain our anger as much as possible. We're just short, yeah, mm -hmm, all right, all right, you're fine. It's, it's what you want to do. That's okay. And then what we do is after they leave, what we do is we'll call all our friends and we try to establish a posse. Like, can you believe this person said this about me? How dare they? Are you with me on this one? And then person's like, oh yeah, I'm with you. I can't believe it. You know, what we do is we call all our best friends. We try to get a posse on our team. Or it's like, saddle up the horses. Let's, you know, we're just, this is, you try to get everybody on your team. And you notice here, Paul doesn't say, hey, when you brought your criticism to me, he says, I didn't go to James, the church leader in Jerusalem. I didn't go to Peter. I didn't go to the other disciple, the other apostles, and I didn't get everybody on my team. Notice where he said he went. He went to the Lord. He says, I have a clear conscience. And just as David wrote about in the Psalms where David said, search me, O God, know my heart. He says, and see if there be any wicked way in me. See, sometimes when people bring criticism against us, some of the times it's legitimate. 
And some of the times we need, when we go to the Lord, we have to say, Lord, is this, is this true? Is this actually something that I need to change in my life? Do I need to lay this at the foot of the cross and repent? And there's sometimes we do, but there's other times that it is that the criticism that comes against us is not legitimate, and it's nothing more that is criticism full of condemnation. And it's as David said in Psalm 119, he says, turn away the insults which I dread. And Paul says, listen, I've gone to the Lord. I've gone to the Lord, and I have a clear conscience with the criticism I receive. Friends, when you hear criticism or someone come and criticize your life, if there, there is a critic that comes against you, listen, the first place to take it is not to your best friends. It's to take it to Jesus. Take it to your Savior and say, Lord, is this legitimate? If it's not, take away this condemnation because I know there is no condemnation in you. Take it to Jesus. Now, continuing on, we come to find Paul's defense against his critics. You notice one of his defenses against his criticism, against the criticism against him, is his conduct in verse 12. Continuing on, it says, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves, notice it says, in the world, in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly to you. The Corinthian Christians were accustomed to dealing with ministers who were calculated and manipulative, and they figured that Paul must be similar in that fashion. Since Paul said he was going to come to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, but then he did not, they figured, the, the Corinthians figured that they were being manipulated by Paul. And Paul lets them know that this was not the case. And he says there that this is our boasting. Literally, this is our confidence. And he says, this is my confidence. We didn't conduct ourselves on the basis of fleshly or worldly wisdom, but in simplicity. Some translations may say holiness. And then he goes on and says, godly sincerity. Now, if you have studied in your Bible, in various Greek, there are various Greek words that have a deep meaning to them. Highlight that word sincerity. That is a word that means without wax or judged. Some people translate it as judged under the light of the sun. Because oftentimes of this day, what would take place if you wanted to buy a vessel? You would go to the marketplace, and it was there in the marketplace that they would be selling all these vessels. And how they would create these vessels, they would mold them, and they would take these vessels, the, the best vessels were the thinnest vessels, they would take them, and they would put them in the oven, they would fire them, put them in the kiln, and they would fire them, and then they would harden in the oven, and then they would be ready to sell in the marketplace. What would happen sometimes with the very thin vessels that were more expensive, because they were so thin, they would break while they were under the process of firing or being in the oven, and they would have little cracks in them. And an honest dealer would take those vessels and they would throw them away. And then oftentimes what they would say on their, on their marketplace stand, it would say sincera, or where we get our English word, it was sincere. But the dishonest dealers would go and they would take those vessels that had cracks in them and they would fill it with wax. And then what they would do is they would take it there on a day that, uh, you know, you would go out and they would try to put it under a shaded area. Because if you put it under the sunlight, the heat of the sun would go beat down on that vessel and it would begin to melt away the wax in that vessel. And so what Paul is saying, he says, listen, I've been judged under the light of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm sincere. He says, I'm without wax. And I think oftentimes as a believer, one of the things that is important for us is to have a godly sincerity that is produced from the word of God. We need the, we need, we need the word of God to produce that within us. And listen, there's, it's no secret as believers, listen, we're vessels, but Listen, we're cracked. <laughs> we, we're crackpots, if you will. You know, we're just, it wasn't in my notes. But 
dad jokes. And, you know, and just, we, you know, we have, we're broken vessels. And what we need, what oftentimes the, what the, 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 the sinfulness within us tries to fill those cracks with worldly wisdom, hypocrisy, and all these things. But listen, those cracks need to be filled by the blood of Jesus Christ. And they need to be filled with the word of God. That's what needs to take place. Listen, we, we, we can't, we don't have time. Jesus is coming. We don't have time to be messing around and filling ourselves with fleshly wisdom and the wisdom of this world that oftentimes just melts under the heat of the trial. Listen, the wisdom of this world, it can, if you notice, it continues to change over and over again. You find that. But listen, the wisdom of the word of God is unchanging. And listen, when we fill ourselves with the wisdom of of the word of God, and the word of God produces a godly sincerity within us. Church, we need the word of God to fill the cracks, fill the holes in our life, and we need to have a godly sincerity to walk through the criticism we receive in this life. Now, not only was Paul depending on godly sincerity to defend him against criticism, But notice he also reminded them of the work of the Lord. Notice in verse 14, he says, As you also have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you are also our, or excuse me, you are, you also are ours. Notice he says, in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, perhaps you remember when the Apostle Paul came before or before the apostle Paul was a was the, the apostle and a pastor, you remember he was a man that breathed threats against the church, and he participated in the first martyr in the early church of Stephen, and he was a man that absolutely detested everything of Jesus Christ. But after the apostle Paul got saved. It was then that the Lord took a man that persecuted, killed Christians, and he sent him on a missionary journey to plant churches for him. And then when you get there, and when Paul gets there, he stays a year and a half in Corinth. And at one point, he's trying to decide, you know, do I continue on? Do I stay here? And the Lord reminds him, and he says, I have many people in the city. He says, continue on. And it was there that there was somebody, there was a group of Jews that were there in the city. They came, they wanted to take Paul to a Greek court, so to speak. I'm paraphrasing here. You can read about it in the book of Acts. And as they took them there, there's a man by the name of Sosthenes. And he takes Paul and he brings him to the Greek court. And the Greeks are so just annoyed by this that, they, that the, these Jewish people would take the, Paul's own countrymen would take him to their court that instead of hearing them, they eventually just, the judge turns his head and they end up beating this man, Sosthenes. When Paul writes to the Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, you know who the first person he greets? Sosthenes. The man that took him to court and was beaten there in court. Wouldn't you say that's a genuine work of God? You can't make that stuff up. Like this is just too, it's only God can do that. And then God can take a man that persecuted, killed Christians, takes him to plant churches, gets to a spot, is persecuted by that individual, and then that individual gets saved and becomes evidently one of the leaders in the church. It is an act of God. And Paul says, listen, I'm calling on you to remember through all your criticism about me, the genuine work of God that took place. And one of the things that Paul says, listen, what I want to be my boast in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ is the fact that Jesus Christ worked in your life and he worked in my life. In other words, when Jesus returns for the church, when Jesus raptures the church, he says, I want it to be my boast that God worked in your life and he worked in my life. That was Paul's boast. It wasn't about all the things that he accomplished and so forth. In fact, you remember he wrote to the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says that we are God's fellow workers. And he says, by the grace of God, I have been 
appointed essentially a master builder and I laid the foundation of the church, of, which is Jesus Christ. And he says that each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test each one's work. And he says, if anyone's work which was built endures, he will receive a reward. Church, God has given us each a measure of responsibility to build, both in our lives, in our families, in our church. And Paul says that the day of the Lord in which Jesus returns for the church will reveal it by fire. And if it's either going to be a, we'll either determine whether it is a work of the flesh or the work of the spirit. If it is a work of the flesh, it will be burnt up with fire. But if it is a work of the spirit, it will be given a reward. And Paul essentially says, listen, when I meet my Savior face to face, when I see Jesus Christ and I bow my knee, he says, I want to be my boast. Not in the things of this world, but in the work of Jesus Christ and that he saved me. He transformed me. He saved you. He's transforming your life. Listen, I think it's a wonderful thing to hear, you know, when all the various things that are happening about the church, and people ask me, you know, and they tell, and I meet fellow believers, and they say, what's going on in the church? And one of the most exciting things to me, what goes on is when Jesus saves a life, and he gets a hold of a life, and he snatches them from the pit of hell, and then he transforms their life. He gives them the fruit of the Spirit. He makes them more like himself. He makes them more like Jesus. They begin to grow in in patience. They begin to grow in faithfulness and all these different things. Listen, friend, to me, that is the most exciting when believers dig into their Bibles and they surrender to the Lord and they say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm picking up my cross and I'm following you. And listen, I want it to be my boast. When I stand before Jesus and I see my Savior face to face, I'm going to say, Lord, you worked in my life. It was only because of you that I'm here and everyone else in our church. That's our boast, friend. Our boast is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, as we continue on, we see Paul says in verse 15, in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit. He says to pass by the way or pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you. And it says that he helped, or excuse me, and be helped by you on the way to Judea. Now, Paul did not make plans carelessly or haphazardly. He sought the leading of the Lord. But there were times in Paul's life where he had a hard time determining which way was the Lord leading him? For example, you can look at Acts chapter 16 where Paul was trying to go into one area and it says that the Holy Spirit, God himself, forbid him. And then there was times where he tried to go another way and, you know, he just couldn't, the Lord would not allow it. But although Paul could not determine at that point the leading of the Lord, he knew how to find out where the Lord wanted him to go as he waited on him. But his motives were sincere through the process, and he was seeking to please the Lord and not men. The Corinthian Christians, once again, accused Paul of being unreliable and untrustworthy because he said he would come at a certain time, and he was unable to make it. He was unable to come as planned, so instead he sent them a letter. Now, you remember back in the 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verse 7, I believe, the Apostle Paul says, I hope to stay with you a while, and he puts something on the end of that verse. He says, if the Lord permits. Now, when you are serving the Lord, there are many things that you may desire to do. In fact, there are things that I have, there's a lot of things I desire to do when I serve the Lord. And you may say something like this. This is what I want to do, and just like Paul, if the Lord allows or if the Lord permits. And sometimes the Lord allows our desire to serve the Lord in a particular way. Sometimes he allows that, and then sometimes he does not allow the Lord, or the Lord does not allow us to serve him in, his, in a particular manner. 
And what oftentimes happens, someone might recognize our desire to serve the Lord in a particular manner, and they heard us say, we want to serve the Lord this way, but when they see us not serving the Lord in that manner, they seize the opportunity for criticism. And this is what was happening here. They were saying, see, Paul's not doing the will of God. He said he wanted to come if the Lord permits. They forgot that part. And they began to criticize him because the Lord did not permit that. Now, Paul continues on by demonstrating more ways his character, his godly character, defended himself. Notice, fourthly, in verse 17, his character was not fickle, but it was faithful. He says, therefore, when I was planning to do this, he says, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. Verse 18 says, but God, as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. Paul essentially is saying, listen, I wasn't fickle in saying, yes, I am coming, then no, I am not coming. And he goes on to say, as God was faithful, as God is faithful, so is our word to you. And he's saying, listen, I didn't say one thing and do another. He was faithful in following through with that. You know, there's times I, I meet people and, you know, for example, there's times I, I've met people and I say, I, you know, hey, why don't you come visit our church? You know, just come. We'd love to invite you. Oh, yeah, I'm coming. I, Great, man. You're welcome. I swear I'm coming. So you don't need to swear. You just, <laughs> you just need to come. You know, no, I swear I'm coming. You know, I, I promise. I, you know, and I'm going to think, why are you using so many words to tell me? Just say yes or no, you know. Um, I invited someone the other day to come and visit the church, and they said, oh, you know, I would, but I got this, and then I got that, and my wife has a honey-do list for me, and, and I just think, you know, a simple yes or a no will <laughs> we'll do wonders here. And Paul's saying, listen, if my word wasn't back and forth, and I didn't use so many words, and he says, listen, I, was, listen, I wasn't fickle in this, in all the years you knew me. He says, I was faithful. Did you know that faithfulness is a work of the Holy Spirit? In other words, being faithful is like being like Jesus. Jesus tells us that he who is faithful in the least is also faithful in the much. Faithfulness, in other words, knows no difference between the small and great duties of the Christian life. And thus, Christian, it is imperative that we are faithful where God has called us. Now, as we continue on, we also see, fifthly, that in verse 19, Paul's message was unchanging. He says, for the, son, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, he says, by me, Sylvanus, and Timothy, he says, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. In other words, Paul preached a Jesus who was completely reliable and worthy of trust. And it wouldn't be right for the Apostle Paul to serve such a faithful Savior and be considered so unreliable and untrustworthy, especially since Paul had a Savior who was reliable and trustworthy. And I think Paul alludes to a particular point and an important principle that the message of the gospel should affect the messenger. Friend, when we share the message of the gospel, it's got to change our lives. Listen, we can't go forward and preach about the, the message of the gospel and tell people they need to repent of their sin and be forgiven if we haven't repented of our sin and been forgiven ourselves. We can't go around telling people, hey, listen, you need to repent and then live like the rest of the world. God has called us to listen, to apply the gospel message personally to our hearts and be believers that pick up their cross and follow Jesus. Now, as we continue on in verse 20, this is one of my favorite verses. It says, for all the promises of God in him, please take note of that, in him, in Christ, are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. 
The Apostle Paul here in verse 20 is continuing his point about God being true to his word and mentioning the stability of his divine promises. He essentially says, listen, when God says yes, he means it. And God is faithful to fulfill all of his promises in Christ. Friend, here's the important principle in this verse. If you are in Christ, listen, the promises from God apply to you. Now, understand this. If you are not in Christ, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the wonderful promises do not apply to you. Now, there are promises that God will make good on if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ. And that promise is there is an eternity separated from God in hell. But there be far more promises that are so wonderful in the Bible that applies to the believer that has trusted in Jesus Christ and that is positionally in Christ. For example, there's one man that said that there are over 3,500 promises from God that apply to the life of the believer. First one, it, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know, there's one that is good for, listen, there's one for every day for the next nine and a half years. Listen, listen, the promises of God, listen, the wonderful promises of God, the abundant life, the new life, the eternal life, his love for us will never fail, his comfort in trials, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Listen, he promised to return for us. He promised that he would not leave us as orphans. He promised that he would send us his Holy Spirit. Listen, all these promises apply to you and I because we have trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So friend, if you are here this morning and you're doubting the promises of God and thinking, man, I don't deserve the promises or whatever the case may be. Listen, Jesus paid the price so that you can have the promises of God and so that you can have eternal life, abundant life, all these different things. You think, I, I don't know if I deserve. Listen, this verse solidifies it right here. All the promises in him. I love what one man said this way. Let me rephrase it this way. Matthew Henry said, the promises of God are not yea and nay, but they are yes and amen because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now we continue on in verse 21. It says, Paul recalls the work of the Holy Spirit as evidence that he was not manipulative towards the Corinthians. He says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God. There also, or excuse me, verse 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthian church that they were established in Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit and also anointed by God. When you look back at the end of the Gospel of John and the beginning of Acts chapter 1, there is a great illustration that takes place of it. For example, when you look back at, I believe it's John 21, when Jesus appears to the disciples, it says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And that is when Jesus sealed them by the Holy Spirit. And that word seal is a wonderful word. I encourage you to go home and do a word study on that word seal. Same, I believe it's the same word that it's used in Ephesians chapter 1 where the Holy Spirit seals us, if I remember correctly. And it speaks of and can speak of in this day and age of an uh, engagement ring. And essentially what Paul's saying, it says the Holy Spirit is the engagement ring for the great and holy wedding spoken of in the book of Revelation. Uh, the, the Rome would also put their seal on their cargo, and anybody that tampered with that seal uh, were before it reached its final destination, was in major trouble. There's a, there's a ton of work. I encourage you to go home and do a word study on that, and it is wonderful to see. But Paul says that we were sealed by the Holy Spirit, and then shortly after, Jesus tells the disciples to wait in Acts chapter 1. Listen, you can call it what you want. The anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Spirit. Call it what you want. We need it. 
That's, what, that's the important principle. And he says to wait for the, the filling of the Spirit, which produces dunamis, where we get our English word dynamite, and it speaks of power. And that's, where, that's what Jesus is saying. Understand that Paul's saying, listen, you were sealed salvation. You have salvation because of the Holy Spirit. And then he says you were empowered by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, whenever there was an anointing, it would speak of someone called to a particular task to serve the Lord and also the empowerment of that task. And one of the lessons I believe we learn is that in the face of criticism that we receive, God has still anointed us. He still called us to the task and to press through that criticism, and he empowers us to press on through that criticism. Now, as we continue on, verse 23 gives us a little bit more detail on why Paul did not come to Corinth immediately. He says, moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. One of the reasons Paul did not go to Corinth right away was, you remember, due to the condition of the church the disorder that was taking place, the division, the insubordination, the tolerance of sexual immorality. And Paul had to write a letter full of rebuke and correction to this church. And although there were people that were positive to what Paul had wrote, and they responded positively to that, there were pockets of resistance within the church, and they were rebellion, rebelling and unwilling to yield and they were continuing farther down that path of rebellion. In fact, he actually had to write an additional letter that was referred to as the severe letter in which he wrote to the church. And once he wrote that severe letter, you know what he did? He just waited. He just waited. He waited to see how the Corinthians would respond. And essentially what he says, he says, listen, I, I wanted to come. He says, but because of the state of the church and everything that was going on, listen, I wrote to you a severe letter and I waited and I prayed. And he goes on and he's going to say, you know, what good would it have, what good would I have done if I showed up and there's so much rebellion in the church, they, no one is listening to the godly counsel I'm giving, and he essentially says, what good would it be if I just came in and I just started cracking the whip and just started throwing people out? You see that in verse 24. He says, I don't have dominion over your faith. He says, what benefit would it be if I came in and just started throwing people out of the church rather than waiting, praying, giving people an opportunity for the grace of God to work and for them to repent? And he goes on in chapter four and he says, what good it would have done if I showed up and everybody's sorrowful? He said, I just would have driven you farther in sorrow. He says, you're not willing, you weren't willing to listen to me. And sometimes when you warn somebody, and, and, and look, there's been times I've had to do this. I've had to write a letter to somebody when they're unwilling to hear me. And I know and I, and I know they're unwilling to hear me. And I've had to write a severe letter and just say, listen, you're going in a dangerous path. It's not a healthy place where you're going. And listen, your, your, your journey is taking you farther and farther towards the world. And sometimes you have to, I've had to write a severe letter and then all I can do is sit and wait and pray and trust that the Lord is going to work and is going to redeem that situation. And there's been some times where people responded and it was positive. And there's some people I'm still waiting for them to respond after years. There's times where, you know, and I, and I see it, you know, and I just, you need to come back. You need to come back and you need to, you, you need to submit to the foot of the cross well, you know, there's times, and listen, I'm just sharing my heart here, where people have left and they say, you know, I, I can't believe you don't support homosexuality. Love is love. I say, listen, I'm following what Jesus said in his word, that God said marriage is between a man and a woman. And I'll write him a letter. Just say, 
this is what God said. I'm, if you have a problem, you have to take it up with God. That's, that's the bottom line. And sometimes I just, I have to sit and I have to wait. And perhaps you've been in a similar situation. Perhaps you have a prodigal where you've been waiting. And you've thought, Lord, I've told them the truth. I've warned them. Here's what you do. You keep praying. You keep praying. And they may be criticizing you. Oh, you're so narrow-minded and you're so old school or whatever. Keep praying. Keep praying through all that criticism. Listen, the Holy Spirit, I like what one, one man called him, the holy hound of heaven. He will track them down and he will convict them of sin. He's much better at it than I am and that you are. And let's pray that the Holy Spirit would do that work in their lives. Now, lastly, in spite of all the criticism that Paul received, how does Paul respond to the church? Look, this, this is practical, and this is hard in verse 4. He says, this is how I felt. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, he says, I wrote to you with many tears. Not that I should, not that you should be grieved. He says, but know this, but that you might know the love of which I have so abundantly for you. Despite all the verbal assaults, their lack of appreciation, their insults, and so forth, Paul says, I want you to know the love that I have for you is abundant. You know, the Lord never allows me to teach something without learning it and living it that week. I got a phone call this week that someone was criticizing and they had, they, had le they, have left our, they had left our church a while ago and, and they just said, you know, and, and it was full of criticism and I, and I just said, and at first I was getting real riled up because I'm a man. I, I'm just, I, I'm flesh and blood. I'll, just, I'll be honest. I was, I was getting so riled up and I thought about this verse. Paul says, know that I've loved you abundantly through all the criticism. And I think, you know, there's times where there's been room, you know, I, and I'll be honest about me. There's been times where rumors have been spread about me and lies that has, someone has spread. I remember years ago someone did. And, you know, and I just think, <sighs> I'll be honest my first thought is, Lord, I know you've called me to love them, but what's the bare minimum? <laughs> You're laughing because you've prayed the same thing. <laughs> David said in the, in the Psalms, he says, Lord, take the insults of my accusers. And he says, take their cloak and wrap them up. Take their belt and tie them up. And sometimes I think, Lord, can I pray that? <laughs> Lord, when they put on their winter coat, just cinch it up a little tighter, you know. <laughs> Jesus said in the Sermon of the Mount, listen, the preacher is preaching to himself here. He says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, this is the words of Jesus, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Church, when we're criticized, and there are personal criticisms, darts, that are thrown against us, God has called us to love more abundantly so that people know that we are the children of God. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord. As, as Paul wrote, his boast was in your work in the church. And Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Lord, don't stop the work in our hearts, God. Lord, help us surrender to you, Lord. 
especially in the face of criticism, God. People critique. Lord, and it feels like condemnation. Lord, help us to press on towards the upward call of God. Lord, we pray for anyone here that has faced criticism, Lord, from friends, family, in the workplace, from the enemy. Lord, we pray that you would remove that, God. Help them to take every thought captive, Jesus. Fight the good fight of faith, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Church, may the Lord bless you this week. I found oftentimes that while I am studying for a message, the Lord challenges me to live it. After I teach a message... He often challenges the believer to live it. You may face criticism this week. You may, f- may hear someone say, man, you Bible thumper or whatever. <laughs> I'm a Christ follower. You may, f- you may have people just unwarranted. It's just, it'll come up. And listen, come back to this chapter. Look at, the, look at the things that Paul wrote. Fill yourself with the word of God. Have a godly sincerity as you walk about the your life against criticism. Amen. If you need prayer, there'll be those up here to pray for you. Perhaps you've been facing condemnation. People up here to pray for you, to help and aid in that. Let's close in the chorus. May the Lord bless you guys.